Massive thank you as always to patrons Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns and Sarah Turner. This week's random call out goes to patron Sheena Bilmus. You can support us on patreon.com. It's not just in your head or you can follow us on social media and help spread the word. Today we speak to one of the authors of a recently published book slash manifesto, Psychoanalysis and Revolution by Ian Parker and David Pavon Koya, published by 1968 Press, who also have a Patreon. Uh, it's well worth a look. Get ready because this is an enlightening one. In the mental health field, too often we've made it seem as if it's just in your head just in your head like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20 percent. that impacts people's mental health we can't have a profit driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy ian i thought it would be useful to our listeners if you would give a paragraph or two of where you're coming from well i taught for many years in a psychology department in manchester in uh, what was the old polytechnic, which was a kind of second rank institution. But that was really good because it meant that we had students who were local, students who were more likely to be mature students, already had families or came from the different communities that that make up uh, Manchester. And that meant that we were able to connect critical perspectives on psychology uh, with their lives and learn from those. Uh, So I've always thought of myself as being more of an anti-psychologist than a psychologist. (laughs) Um, And it took me a while to uh, turn to psychoanalysis because I could see so many people who are critical inside psychology would turn to psychoanalysis and become evangelists for psychoanalysis instead. So I avoided it for that reason. And it was only when I started learning about the critiques from the women's movement and from the anti-colonial, anti-racist movement, internal critiques that were also using psychoanalysis that I decided it was worth going into. Uh, So I trained as a psychoanalyst and I practice as a psychoanalyst now. I'm also a Marxist. I was a Marxist before I went into psychology to teach. Um, and I'm involved in different Marxist organisations at the moment. Um, I have been for a long time um, an activist in the Fourth International, which is a Trotskyist organisation, but a Trotskyist organisation that I think is quite open to different arguments from anti-racism and feminism and recently from uh, ecology, calling itself a eco-socialist organization now. So that's where I'm coming from. That's a great place to come from. I am interested in how you see psychoanalysis, which is usually presented as a very labor-intensive and in the United States market-driven health care system, also money-intensive practice that is highly individual in its application how you apply that to what is needed, which would be a unified mass movement based on class as a kind of pillar or as the center stick, the center of an umbrella with the fabric and the spokes being all the other issues, whether they're feminism, racism, ecology, and so on. But how can you How can you use psychoanalysis to galvanize people to see their common lot and unite to change the system? Well, just to reel back just a second, I I also want to say that I've been involved for many years in Asylum magazine, which is a magazine for democratic psychiatry, uh, now called Magazine for Democratic, uh, for Radical Social Health. So kind of anti-psychiatry is also part of the mix here. And I suppose the the thing about uh, psychiatry in Britain is that psychiatry is available on the National Health Service and is is a a free service for many people, uh, Mm. which carries with it opportunities and also carries with it lots of dangers. Uh, it carries it with it the dangers that people can be sectioned very easily, and you see people from uh, the black community, for example, 
are overrepresented in their mental hospitals by four times that of uh, white people in the population. Uh, so, so there's, a, there's all kind of issues there that that we need to deal with, which are connected with your question, which is about the privatized, individualized, and expensive forms of therapy that are available to people at the moment. And what I look to is not the not the forms of private psychoanalysis that operate for people. Um, which are very expensive here, yeah. as they are in the United States. But the tradition of free psychoanalysis that mm-hmm. was available from the very earliest moments is, is very, it's a hidden history to psychoanalysis yeah. that we talk about in the book. It's a very interesting book by um, Elizabeth Danto some years ago called Freud's Free Clinics. And in there, you have an account of the way in which even Freud was supporting the development of free clinics in Vienna and Budapest and Berlin. So it's that history that we look to as as providing some kind of guide, guide point for the kind of clinic that we have in mind when we're talking about the clinic. I actually wanted to read a short passage from your book that sort of ties into that, and um, not directly, but in a roundabout way that I find really uh, fascinating. It says, even the first psychoanalysts under the hostile conditions in their new host countries to which they had fled had to renounce political militancy and protect themselves against the anti-communist persecution characteristic of Western countries during the Second World War and then the Cold War. They pretended to be apolitical. That's, I think, the coolest phrase, and thus adapted to their new reality, and they depoliticized and adapted psychoanalysis, turning psychoanalysis itself into an adaptive treatment. I kind of see that as maybe related to what you're saying, and that maybe the origins, there actually was um, enough of an analysis of you know, whether you want to call it political economy or just how society works to understand, yeah. okay, this is a valuable um, this is a valuable thing for people, and then and then the the, I don't know, various you know, the Nazis and Red Scare and all these things happened and psychoanalysts had to retreat away from and then maybe get absorbed more into the capitalist system. So I, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead or something, but that's just that, that passage really stood out to me in your book. No, that, that's right. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's 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 really useful. Um, and what happened, of course, with the rise of fascism is that fascism destroyed psychoanalysis in continental <laughs> Europe. And yes. many of the psychoanalysts were either members of the socialist parties or the communist parties, uh, psychoanalysis was was very much um, an approach that lent to the left. And that link to the left mm. was broken uh, by fascism when the psychoanalysts fled and uh, were in a precarious position. I think it's quite understandable that they should be worried that they would be ex- um, expelled from the United States or Britain mm-hmm. uh, if they if they kind of um, came out publicly with their radical ideas. And so they kept quiet, and they had to adapt to the society that they found themselves in, and psychoanalysis was changed. Psychoanalysis was changed from being an approach which challenges relations of power, and it was changed into an approach that endorses and adapts people to relations of power, whether it's the family or capitalism or racism, that people are told that they should be good citizens and fit in and be well behaved. And unfortunately, that's what happened to psychoanalysis as it went into exile around the world. Well, are there, I I have read a lot of Freud, are there articles that you would cite in Freud that talk about that approach? Because I didn't find them, so I want to know. I I can't remember the title of the article exactly, but there's a speech that Freud gave in 1918 in Budapest at one of the psychoanalytic conferences. Now, Budapest in 1918, was a time when there was rebellion and there was the possibility yeah. there would be a socialist government, a communist government. Uh, one of the uh, one of the leading psychoanalysts, Sandor Ferreci, uh, was appointed as a as a as a figure who would be in charge of mental health services during that times, during those times of revolt, those those times when it was possible that the isolation of the Soviet Union would be broken. 
and that revolutions in the rest of Europe would would come to the support of the Bolsheviks and uh, make the revolution a genuinely international process. Now, Freud gave his speech in 1918 in Budapest, and he said very clearly that psychoanalysis should be available and free as part of welfare provision provided by the state. Uh, he was he was influenced in that by the other more radical psychoanalysts like Wilhelm Reich, a Marxist. And uh, Freud, in no ways, was a Marxist. He was not a Marxist. He was a liberal, um, but he went that far to 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 advocate psychoanalysis being free, and he he supported the initiatives that were being advocated by. Wilhelm Reich and other radical psychoanalysts, he supported the free clinics in Budapest and Berlin and Vienna. Quite amazing. It is. Was that his falling out with Ferenczi? No, no, that wasn't. That wasn't. No, uh, uh, Ferenczi was uh, was on the left as well. Um, yes, so he was. He was. Yeah, and uh, I think it was the kind of more radical techniques that Ferenczi uh, engaged in that that led to that. Uh, falling into psychoanalysis. So we've got to think about the way that psychoanalysis becomes crystallized and bureaucratized and operates as a kind of orthodoxy. Um, and we've got to be alive to the many different movements and ideas that there are inside psychoanalysis. It's not one just one fixed grid. It's a it's a lively debate that goes yes. on. Yes, it, it certainly is. And even in the early American Communist Party, they found psychoanalysis to be a reactionary activity. Yeah. Even well, though psychoanalytic it, books were burnt in Germany and they were burnt in, in the Soviet Union under Stalin. Huh? Yes, and before that, Soviet Union had the most second to most vital psychoanalytic center in the world before Stalin exterminated them. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep. So it was connected with the radical politics even mm. there. Then, yeah. yeah, it was part of the flourishing of a democratic society after 1917, which unfortunately was closed down. And I think mm -hmm. whenever we're thinking about possibilities of radical change, we need to think about the possibilities of new movements around radical mental health and look mm. back to those times as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, I, you know, I don't want to sort of derail any particular direction, but I just had a thought that uh, I suspect that the listeners of this show know the difference between all the different psi uh, disciplines or I doubt in, in, it. industries. I <laughs> but it was yeah. certainly interesting I mean, no, don't, to me. Most people don't. I wouldn't. Yeah, no. uh, like that, that, that they share a sort of common... Uh, word in some respects, at least part of it, but they all do essentially different things. Is it possible just briefly to run through the? Is it th there's essentially three or four different psi disciplines, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can do well, that. Oh, well, do you? One of you want to do that? Um, well, I was I was just going to say from from my read, and I had to do a I couldn't do a thorough read uh, in apologies, but the skim I, it was I, I was seeing the distinctions you were making was as like psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, and psychologists as kind of a distinct three. Yeah, there's that's, there's that's probably fine. more, but sure. if I don't know if if you could say those three, I mean, I could make up a, <laughs> I could comment on a few others maybe, or we could. But what's the yeah. difference between those three professions or 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 approaches? Well, well, let's start with psychiatry. Psychiatry is a medical approach, which is trying to look for disease processes. And so psychiatrists are trained to spot symptoms, treat them as underlying illnesses, and to give cures. And those cures are usually physical cures, medicines, and sometimes worse, things like lobotomies and leucotomies and electroshock treatment and that kind of thing. So they look for physical treatments for what they think are physical problems. Now, psychoanalysis is very different from that and had to break from psychiatry uh, and listen to what people said. I suppose another approach is psychology. Psychology is mainly concerned with people's observable behavior 
And again, tries to adapt people to society, changing their wrong thoughts, the thoughts that are supposed to make them unhappy, and to stop them from exaggerating and catastrophizing and all of that kind of thing. And the idea is that if you can stop people from thinking in a bad way, then the then the world will be a nicer place for them. So psychology focuses on the individual and doesn't address uh, social issues. Now, again, I think psychoanalysis breaks from that because psychoanalysis isn't concerned with the individual on their own, but it's as much concerned with social relationships as individuals. It's concerned with family relationships, it's concerned with group processes, It's concerned with what happens as we relate to each other in society. And so there's a challenge to psychology in psychoanalysis, as well as a challenge to psychiatry. So we could just start with those. I, I could actually, well, I do this like narcissistic thing sometimes where I just talk about myself. Well, I was going to say I could actually give a little case study of a, of a teenager I'm working with right now that he is interacting with all three, myself being, I guess, on the psycho, I'm not even a psychoanalyst, but um, to even paint the picture, I'll just, I'll try to do this really briefly. So the psychiatrist that he's been working with, you know, they say, oh, okay, this is depression. Here's some, you know, SSRI drugs. And it doesn't work very well for him, um, but he he actually believes in it, and so I don't you know I don't argue with him about that. There's a school psychologist who has a series of kind of metrics, right? There's an assessment. He qualifies for something in California and other states called an IEP. It's an individualized education program where basically it's like a special needs thing where <clears throat> he qualifies for something called emotional disturbance because he has you know emotionally intense issues, and so. Uh, he gets some extra time or, you know, they give him some extra things so they can do the schoolwork. <laughs> he's, he's actually intellectually way beyond his, his years. He's like a, he's, he talks like he's a PhD student or something and he's like 15, but he's like really sensitive uh, emotionally. I was talking to the school psychologist a couple days ago and he's like, you know, we got a release of information. And, oh, how's he doing in therapy and everything? And I was swearing a lot while talking to the psychologist and I was like, it's really fucked up that this is happening and that was happening. And the psychologist was getting uncomfortable Oops. and, and yeah. I was saying, well, the thing is, um, I, I don't, I couldn't really give you, he kept going back to like, well, what do you see as the, what progress is he making with X, Y, Z behavior? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't think any sort of behaviorist metrics would be helpful in understanding the issue. I see the issue as everyone in his life from parents, his family, the school system, uh, have been trying to pawn him off to different professionals thinking that there is some sort of metric or medical method that will get him to not want to kill himself anymore, which makes him want to kill himself. And I think that's actually the issue. And this, like the psych, the, this, the school psychologist was getting more and more uncomfortable. The more honest I was with him about the problem that I saw with the kid. Right. So anyway, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yes. The, the brief narcissism here, just to say, I think the difference is I was sitting with the kid trying to understand him. That's what I do every week. And we try to build a relationship and help him understand what's going on. And that's, I guess, I just call myself a therapist and a psychoanalyst. I think that's yeah. the main difference, yeah. right? A psychologist yeah. and, a psych- and, a, and a psychiatrist typically do neither of those things, or, or yeah. they can, some do, right? But anyway, yeah, there you go. I, I, mean, I should I, maybe I should say that you know I have I have the the, uh, the label and identity as psychoanalyst, but that means that I'm at the top of the heap in the status hierarchy, and there are many psychoanalysts who have that. Uh, status who don't do psychoanalysis at all. They mm-hmm. do lots of other things if they're trained as a psychiatrist or psychologist. They sometimes do psychiatry or psychology. They don't do psychoanalysis. And we find psychoanalytic work is carried out by psychotherapists, it's carried out by counselors, mm. many of whom are working class, many of whom are women. Um, so we need to think about the places where psychoanalysis takes place. It's not only the psychoanalysts, it's in lots of places. And, and I suppose this book is trying to key into that practice as a as a liberating practice wherever it is. Well, it's a very important thing, but I'm still stuck on my previously stated concern, which is since in order to win, we need a huge base of people together to recognize our common interests and that we are the majority. And yet psychoanalysis seems like an individual practice. How do you make the bridge between that and activism on a mass scale? That's a big ask. 
Um, yes. <laughs> you know, my life is divided most of the time between being a psychoanalyst, seeing people one-to-one in the clinic, and I don't make any claims there to change them into revolutionaries. Yeah? No. Uh, I give people a space to speak and to reflect, and the choices that they make are their choices. Now, I know that sounds very liberal and not very revolutionary, but I think it's, it's perfect. absolutely you know, necessary that people... Mm-hmm make up their own minds and have a courage to think for themselves. And I think that's what the space that psychoanalysis leaves open. Now, in my political activity as a Marxist in different social movements, I can bring in some psychoanalytic sensitivity to the way that people are speaking about their lives and what drives them into politics and think about the ways in which the groups and organizations are operating, you know, that there's something about the unconscious. There's something about what is beyond us, what we aren't able to immediately grasp, that is at work in every social relationship. So Mm -hmm. we see this in the structure of left-wing groups, for example, where people try and pretend, often try and pretend that, they're speaking openly, communicating openly to each other, that there are no power relations <laughs> because we're all building a big political movement together. And anyone who raises questions about the power relationships in the group gets sidelined. They're not listened to. They're treated as troublemakers. Now, I think what we learn from anarchist feminism, and I'm thinking of the work of Joe Freeman, Mm. in her little pamphlet called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, is that in these groups that pretend that there's no structure, there is always structure. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand how that structure works, whether we like it or not, how it operates beyond us, and to reflect on that and to challenge it. So that requires a bit of conflict. Um, But I think it's kind of like psychoanalytically informed because it's about the way that things are running beyond us the way that we repeat authoritarian relationships even though we don't mean to the way that uh, we can operate in that way in a reflective way to, to to bring some psychoanalytic ideas to bear on what we're doing you know i've i've been struggling with this the, just that question, Harriet, that you pose that, you know, the first, the first bit of the answer, Ian, for you was like, well, you know, that's like a big, you know, it's a big ask, uh, you know, and I'm not, that's, I don't try to turn people into revolutionaries. Um, I struggle all the time, uh, the, all the time with this, uh, like, does, you know, just the, can, ther- can therapy even fit into, or psychoanalysis, whatever we want to call this, uh, can it even fit into, um, you know, can it convert people into revolutionaries? Answers probably... Not, not an absolute no, but mm-hmm. people can arrive at conclusions somehow mm-hmm. and arrive at, um, you know, transformations into uh, taking certain actions or changing their way of thinking or, or shifting an ideology or something. Um, but, but I think very often, and I guess, well, this is, this is maybe, a, um, this, this moves it to a different direction, but the critique I've been developing, uh, I think at first angrily, and now I think I'm chilling out about it, is the mainstream discourse. I don't know about it in the UK, but in the United States, this um, I did like a solo episode a while ago called A Critique of TikTok Therapy. And it was kind of uh, polemically describing this sort of social media phenomenon for, I think, primarily kind of millennials and Zoomers, this, um, this the, the, the concept, conceptualization of mental health, uh, again, maybe primarily in the U.S., primarily behaviorist and sort of CBT, um, you know, adjacent or influenced of like, uh, this sort of depoliticized sort of self-care narrative and sometimes some pop psych stuff here and there. And I think there is a, that certain, certain segments of the masses have sort of absorbed certain, I think, McDonaldized, um, ways of thinking about mental health that isn't the relational stuff that we do in the clinic, so to speak. Um, and I, and I, and I definitely don't see that as, revolutionary. I actually see that that actually can be a, a pretty, um, almost like a capitalist co-optation thing sometimes of this, like reinforcing individualism in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. so, so that, that frustrates me sometimes, but, um, 
But I do think anyway, bringing it back to what you're saying that that there is, I do think there is a value though in, I think just a certain, um, uh, what do we call it? Maybe just a sensitivity or a, um, um, honing in our observation, our, our relational observational skills, like you're saying, within power, power dynamics and relationships, that something like psychoanalysis or psychotherapy can can augment, if that makes sense, right? You, you're able to notice kind of what's going on in your social life in a more nuanced way, which could which could be revolutionary, right? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I think that's right. It, it, it's. Um... We don't, I don't think it's a good idea to go into left organizations and say, I'm a psychoanalyst, and so I know how you're thinking. No, yeah. don't do it. I mean, that's don't just do it. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it would just be reproducing that kind of specialist, professional power relationship. Um, I work with my comrades as a comrade. I think that's that's what we have to do in our political activity, not pull rank on the kind of... Uh, explanations or interpretation that, that we can we can give um but you know the problem here is one of one of my comrades in brazil um who's been working in the free clinic movement uh, gabriel tupinamba um he's uh, an activist as well as a psychoanalyst um he, he pointed out recently in a, in a discussion we had that that psychoanalysts are very happy to invite people into their organizations and have discussions about art and cinema and mass media or whatever um but they're not very good guests in other places <laughs> <laughs> that they're not very good at listening to other people <laughs> you they, their job. <laughs> they think, i know i know it's it's weird isn't it you know because they mm. think they have they have the truth they have the answer uh but i think we have to be a little more kind of humble about you know the knowledge that we have the the expertise that we have and and i suppose that's why the the book that i wrote with david my mexican comrade um is 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 not an academic text but it's more open i hope and it's the beginning of a dialogue i wanted to bring up something related which is that in the early women's movement, one of the ways that we found our agenda was in consciousness raising, where people talk about issues together in their own personal lives and political and social lives. And from that, an agenda forms, which is the same method as um, Frida Haug use, uses in Germany. Oh, yeah, yeah. And... That is an, a very democratic, although, of course, de facto leaders emerged, it is sounds like a way that you could have psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic information, but also inspire groups of people to unite and make the common issues in their lives. Excuse me. Come true. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I know Frigga Haug's work, and uh, she's going to write the preface for the German edition of the book. Oh, great! Um, I, 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 she's a long-standing activist as well as an academic. Yes. It's really great the work she's been doing, and I think there is something in this in consciousness raising practices that is, in some ways, informed by psychoanalysis. You know, psychoanalysis. Yes. Psychoanalysis has a kind of double life. Um, on the one hand, it, it kind of operates as a professional expertise. And then some of its ideas kind of percolate into yeah. common sense. And, you know, that's the kind of common sense psychoanalysis that we see in the Hollywood films, Hitchcock films, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it also enters into radical practice as people reflect critically on what they're doing. And some kind of psychoanalytic ideas have always been there. They've been there in the women's movement. They've been there in the in the work of Franz Fanon, the kind of Algerian revolutionary yes. uh, in the 1960s as well. Um, they've always been there as a resource. And so I think the the task is to is to look through these psychoanalytic ideas and and to work out which ideas are operating as ideology. You know, these ideas that simply tell people this is how you are and there's nothing you can do about it. And the kind of psychoanalytic ideas which are about 
contradiction and change, the contradiction that is inside us as well as in society. So I have a, <clears throat> I have a maybe challenge question for you. There's something I struggle with. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can be my therapist and help me out in understanding the Mark, the uh, Marxist tension. Because I kind of identify as a Marxist as well. That one big uh, contribution I understand, unless I'm understanding misunderstanding Marx, is that you know he he kind of pushed the anti-idealism piece, right? That that just ideas in and of themselves don't really change much. That that was the whole you know dialectical materialism thing, right? That there's material conditions, there's a sort of economic and material base. And it, you know, it, it does influence the ideas and the ideology and and vice versa. It's not like it's this deterministic thing. Um, but this, this idea that in psychoanalysis, this is, I guess what my struggle is, it's like, Oh, there's different ideas in the mind of the person. Now, now there's a different, um, something that actually is within the material or economic base in society may now change because there's a different idea that I think, you know, some, some Marxists would say, well, well, no, actually, like definitely not. That's not how it works. Right. That there actually has to be, um, stuff that's, that's, uh, really concretely challenging that material base that then gives rise to the different ideology. Right. I mean, do you think that's a false characterization of that idea or, or I don't know, what do you think about that? Well, you know, there's this metaphor that Freud uses of base and superstructure, but I think it was like a false move. <laughs> yeah. I think it was a, it was a, a bad metaphor to use uh, in that uh, kind uh, of way. Uh, uh, um, uh. And I think it actually runs against uh, a lot of what Marx was actually writing about and what later Marxists were concerned with, which was this kind of interaction that there is between our mm. consciousness and the world that we live in. That's what I think of as being dialectical. Um, And we need to uh, be concerned with cultural, political struggle as as importantly as economic struggle in order to lay the basis for people to be able to operate together, work together, and to be able to realise that they have common interests. It's it's kind of the work of ideology is extremely powerful. You know, there's something about ideology uh, that is almost, I'd go so far as to say, material huh? has has effects which bear on people and lock people into mm-hmm. ideas about themselves that are really limiting. Huh? I don't yeah. think you can trace it back to a kind of material base that's under the surface. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing there that you can get to without using language and without using our consciousness of it mm. to grasp it and challenge it. Yeah, I think the French Marxist Althusser and then the um, new Marxism that followed it, which in the United States with Stephen Resnick and, and Richard Wolff, really oh, yes. gets to that because they talk about Freud's concept of overdetermination as a social concept that everything forms everything else in mutuality. So you can't create these, this equals that equals this. But you have to look at how people shape each other. And one of the things exciting, I think, about psychoanalytic thought is in its manifestation in the way Frigga Haug and also the women's movement used consciousness raising is that people in their mutuality and their issues discover that they're suffering from the same things and need each other to change, which is a huge step in getting people galvanized to change. Yeah, I think that's right. And I I think it's something that we've learned from feminism is that there are all kinds of power structures that can intermesh intermesh with capitalist exploitation with the uh, with the subjugation of people in factories forced to sell their labor power mm-hmm. um, giving up of their time hours and hours of the day doing meaningless tasks where they have no control over their creative labor their creative labor is destroyed that what feminism does is to add in uh, other kinds of power relations most mm-hmm. significantly in the family the nuclear family for example and that, that nuclear family is material in some sense uh, uh, as well. Um, but I think the danger, and, and maybe this is where you're coming from, Max, I think the danger 
is that some uh, kind of cultural political people um, then try to ignore the economic base altogether. You know, that the that they, they, they think that the economy is something weird and outside of what is important. <laughs> Whereas I think we have to keep in mind that the economy is part of the struggle, absolutely mm. crucial part of the struggle. You know, who owns what and how we take control of our own lives by seizing the means of production and being able to produce things for the benefit of all rather than for the for profit of few is absolutely crucial to our politics. The economy mustn't be lost sight of as part of this uh, radical uh, political struggle. And I, I think that is, that's my primary concern. I think that I, and I, I think there's a, a sort of a shift happening in the, I think that it, there was an awareness that emerged over the last few years. I think the Bernie and Corbyn campaigns probably primarily, um, but I think people started to realize the, um, I guess, well, you know, the Hillary Clinton thing was one of the easiest, right? Of just like something, something women empowerment. And then, and a lot of people started pointing out, well, what do you, you, you know, yeah. you, you, you can, you can sort of make the bombs pink, but that doesn't, you know, you, you're still bombing a bunch of Middle Easterners to take their oil to keep the political economy intact. Uh, and right? a bunch so, of women who are home with the kids while the right place or is or whatever, like down, down the line, right? I mean, if there's there's very sort of bad faith critiques of of identity mm-hmm. politics, and I think there's then there's better faith ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, whether identity politics is the right phrase for it, anyway, um, maybe yeah, the power re- relational. Uh, I don't know power relations or something, as you're saying, Ian. But um, but yeah, to me, that's that gets to it. And and I definitely I've come to the conclusion, uh, therapy is not going to change the uh, the means of production thing, <laughs> right? Like it's not uh, uh, like like you don't you don't like end the therapy session and the client now somehow gets you know the pri- the the private property uh, basis of society doesn't doesn't shift from that um sure. someone still owns you know the landlord's still a dick and the and the boss is yeah. still an asshole um, yeah sure. but, so. poten- but potentially you come out of that process with a, a framework or a, a particular way of seeing the world that uh helps you you know like i thought one of the really mm. interesting sure, things yeah, yeah. that was w- w- that was in your book was this idea that psychoanalysis has its end in political action and like you said you know you can't ever push that on <laughs> on no. a client or whatever but it's that idea that uh that from leaving uh, uh a session or the practice or or whatever that that you essentially become switched on um to like i said a level of awareness you didn't have before and it, it's really interesting uh, recently reading um the sort of final uh, conclusion to uh, was it coming up short, um, and in that oh, right. she talks, ab- yeah, mm-hmm. and in that she talks about like the one one of the one one of the uh, people that she spoke to who seemed the most um, enthusiastic about their future. I'm paraphrasing, I guess. I can't completely remember what it was, but it was this. It was that they were politically switched on. They were involved in lots of things. They had sort of meaning and purpose. They were connected to lots of people, and they were pushing for some some sort of justice. And that it wasn't dependent on some sort of self-aggrandizing story of like, mm. oh, I'm overcoming all the obstacles. I'm going to be by myself. You know, yeah. One day I'm going to be rich, and you know, blah blah blah. And I'm just by myself, and it's a cruel world out there, and I just have to look after number one. Well, that's a piece. Where, yeah, thank you for that, um, Liam. Because I think I think that circling back, I think there is a sometimes. I think the switching on is a great way to put it, right? Where some people, I think, just hadn't thought much about a whole lot of things in their lives. And once they do start thinking about those things, that's when the ball gets rolling, you know? So that's something I think we can certainly offer in our, in our field. Yeah. We certainly can also offer that you feel less isolated and frightened if you join other people because the power of being together and is much greater than the power of being alone, which is not very powerful. And also I think Althusser as, you know, the, I think he was the prominent Marxist after World War II. His idea of ideological state apparatuses of the family, religion, and authoritarian education that teach you how to discipline and police yourself from the inside out so they don't need the cops to teach Mm -hmm. you the lines of dominance and submission. 
mm-hmm. and that if you can, and that what Althusser, who was very Freudian and a Marxist, did was try to show those social structures and personal structures that get us to accept submission and to work with those, which is kind of a bridge between psychoanalysis and politics and the left. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I, I, I suppose we need to you know, be clear that um, we're not pretending to invent this connection between autism and psychoanalysis, not at all. We're kind of putting mm. an argument on the table Again, it's an argument that's yes, been yeah. made many times, and Althusser was one of those who made that argument. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, the writers in the Frankfurt School in the 1920s yeah. in Germany were others who made that argument, and it just needs to be repeated. Uh, it's an argument that needs to be repeated, and we need yes. to remind ourselves of that, that history yeah. of connection. Yes, we do, and keep that alive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I, I was thinking about this this question of identity that 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 you raised. Was it Max or Liam? I can't remember. But Max yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used the I used the term um, identity politics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that the, most of the problem with identity politics. I just speak as a Marxist instead of a psychoanalyst for a moment. Um, I think most of the problem with identity politics is an obsession with identity politics by people who are against it. You know, they look for it everywhere and um, become obsessed with um, feminist movements or Black Lives Matter movements or other people who they see as dividing the struggle. Um, Whereas I think that identity is something that comes into being and mutates and is dialectical in a way. Uh, And we treat it in psychoanalysis as something dialectical. We, we don't aim to reinforce people's identity or to, to build an identity, but rather, if anything, psychoanalysis deconstructs or unravels identity and enables people to think of the different competing contradictory identities that they have in, 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 mm-hmm. their, in their struggle. That's, That's right, yeah. and they certainly don't pigeonhole people on the basis of one aspect of their identity. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a phrase in, in Freud where he says, the aim of psychoanalysis is where it was, their ego shall be. You know? As if you should push away the id and build your ego as your central point of reference. And I think there's different ways of reading that. If you mm. go back to the German, wo es war, uh, soll ich werden, where it was, there I should be, is the way that you can translate it. Where yeah. it was, there I should become. Yeah. And we read it in that way. We're not aiming to reinforce the individual ego, but we're enabling people to find out who they are in their social relationships, mm-hmm. in that stuff which is incomprehensible to them, which is frightening, which is other to them. Uh, so to be there. To be there in that broader spread of meaning and relationships in the unconscious processes that drive us, rather than locking ourselves into our individual identity or our individual ego. It's a, it's a more radical way of reading the task of psychoanalysis. And actually, that's one of the things that uh, I found particularly uh Interesting, I guess that's a maybe a word that says nothing, but like your conceptualization of the unconscious ran exactly the opposite of of what I had thought it was as someone who'd read, you know, a lot of Carl Jung stuff and whatever, like, and it suddenly made a lot more sense. Like Carl Jung's thing is like, okay, there's this collective unconscious and uh, we all have it and it is full of all this sort of mystical, mythical stuff. Mm. But you, you sort of actually... Yeah push back on that and yeah uh, i really liked what you said so i don't know if you want to talk a bit about that i'd like that too yeah i, I suppose there's this two kind of traps um one is the trap of of psychoanalysis and freud that we read about in the psychology textbooks you know where you've got this image of a, a kind of iceberg you know where we're conscious yes, of that's right. the rest is all hidden under the surface uh, but usually that turns into 
an image of the unconscious as being like a, a, a huge room inside our heads, you know, some space inside our heads where everything is bubbling away, um, connected to biological biological kind of pushes and impulses and drives and instincts and all of that kind of thing. And uh, so that then the task of psychoanalysis is to make people civilized, to kind of deal with all that stuff inside their head, all the rubbish inside their head and make themselves, make them fit in to become civilized themselves. Now, I think that's a quite mistaken idea of the unconscious. The unconscious isn't something inside us. The unconscious is, if you like, um, the other side of language is the way I like to think of it. Um, you know, that we have the conscious Like mind. Lacan, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Lacanian psychoanalyst, so there we yeah. are. That's where it comes yes. out. But, um, you know, kind of there's the conscious meanings of things, which are the meanings that we share with each other and that we think about. But there's, there's always a a shadow side, an other side to our language, the stuff we can't say, the stuff we can't think about, the stuff that's pushed away. And that stuff isn't only inside our head. That's outside in our social relationships as well. You know, not being able to talk about what's happening in our families to our family, not being able to talk about what's happening in the group to our comrades, all of that stuff which is like taboo and forbidden and pushed outside of the conventional discourse, of the things that we're allowed to talk about. All of that stuff is the unconscious. So I think of it in that way, in a kind of social way. But the other trap is the Jung trap, which is where you have this kind of mystical realm, which is kind of universal, and then you have kind of different archetypes which are kind of moving around, and that leads you into some really bad directions you know mm-hmm. yeah, i think it's no accident prescriptive that, yeah and it's no accident that jung stayed you know and became head of the german psychotherapeutic association under the nazis because jung oh, wow. was then talking about different racial archetypes you know that that the jews have this kind of way of thinking and aryans have that way of thinking and black people have this way of thinking and it really horrible racist mm. stuff because of this kind of idea of of collective unconscious stuff that the expert can see and identify and tell you about you know, so, um, I, you know, we set ourselves against that as well. I think those are the two traps about the unconscious that we need to be aware of. We need oh, to yeah, think about our unconscious oh, yeah. as something that is historically produced. Historically and constantly produced, produced also. Absolutely. And reproduced, yeah. And yeah. constantly produced and reproduced yeah. and changeable. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. exciting rather than a kind of religious absolute somewhere in the distance, which is Jungians and scary. That is a uh, Ian, you just blew my mind. I don't, <laughs> I don't this happens sometimes, like in a yep. yeah, I'm gonna like think about this for, for like weeks and and I'm gonna re, I'm gonna I'm gonna find the bits in your book about this, by the way. I've never even thought about this with you. That's nuts. Yeah, but it's also this thing of like what's on the inside and what's on the outside. And that was one of the sort of uh, the hooks that got me into reading various different uh, literature was I remember it was in some beginner's guide to Jung thing and he, he was walking with someone and, you know it's like those illustrated cartoon books <laughs> for people <laughs> with low IQs who learn like too many words um, and he was just uh, in the cartoon he's walking with someone and the person is telling them about their thoughts or feelings and he says to them like did you think they were your thoughts or feelings he's like well if they're not mine whose are they Mm-hmm. And and it's exactly that thing of like socializing the unconscious makes like exactly what you said, Max, about having your mind blown. When I read it, I was like, of course, like that's mm-hmm. exactly what it is like. And it, the, the whole idea mm-hmm. of identity or who we think we are is completely dependent on other people. And the thoughts and feelings that we have mm-hmm. in our head aren't necessarily ours, but we walk around with them. And like you've said, Harriet, whether that's mm-hmm. that can be in a subservient manner or a hmm. dominating manner that, that, that makes me fascinating think, i'm just i'm just like walking around drunk now i'm in this image of myself like i'm like wait a minute what's going on where we're like well i could actually see the 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 sort of foundational marxist ideas fitting better into a conceptualization of 
the unconscious then, right, with historical materialism, dialectical materialism, actually fitting far better than either an individualistic unconscious or a collective unconscious from that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's that's kind of where you're coming from with that, Ian, but that actually fits really well, right, to just understand there's history, there's material history, right? You can say, like, this land was conquered by these people at this particular time in history, this language was imposed on these particular people. Like that's where the water comes from. That's where, Mm -hmm. you know, it rains this much over there. This is where the tennis shoes come from and everything. And that there's all kinds of pieces of our unconscious that are, that are rooted in material reality and in history, personal history, collective history. Um, And so you can, you can kind of move away from a sort of, um, because I think the danger I've always felt felt with a certain um, kind of Freudian psychoanalysis is a similar prescriptiveness as Freud as, um, you know, here's the, uh, not necessarily defense mechanisms, but I, um, I don't know Freud enough to even articulate it, but I felt that Freud was, was kind of doing something similar to that as he was saying, not archetypes necessarily, but this is what's, go- oh, oh, so the complex is right. Oh, epital complex. It's like, who knows if that's actually happening in your unconscious, you just made the shit up on Coke and you just like, you just produce an entire like field out of it. Like that's, that's yeah. insane. Right. So to do that on this like bizarre individualized level with one person prescribing what's really going on in the unconscious. But on the other hand, if someone's saying, well, here's a whole bunch of like, I studied a bunch of mythology and now I'm just making stuff up from whatever access to mythology I had. Um, whereas if you, if you have just some information about history and society, you could just plug in what's going on in the unconscious from that. Right. But, but also it, it's probably only helpful if it's being unfurled from the individual level, level, like within the relationship as well. So okay, anyway, I'm just mind blown over here. Well, I, I think what we're talking about and what we're doing here is really important because it's saying that that which in at least U.S. society has been reserved for the very well-off who could afford four days a week of highly expensive individual therapy, we're saying that this is an approach an approach to knowing ourselves and knowing that that which we state may come from all sorts of places that we need to interrogate and having this sort of curiosity about what we think, what we feel, and how we feel it. And that's where that idea of organizing through talking together honestly about personal things and personal relationships which are not personal, they're also social, and discovering the social commonality, and from there discovering what can be an agenda to transform that which is oppressive to us, and is very much oppressive to us as a group. And so, you know, and it also mitigates against the idea of anyone having the answer for everybody else. Exactly. Which is bizarre. I have to say, I actually have an 11 a.m. phone call, or that's my time. I'm going to jump off. Ian, you have changed my entire life, and I hope you guys have an amazing rest of the podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what an talk. honor. I'm just I'm just going to go like smoke a cigarette or something. Okay, all right. Go right. from here. I just um, wondered if you wanted to sort of respond to some of the stuff that Max and Harriet were saying, if, if you can remember it. Well, I suppose one thing that's influenced – both me and David has been the argument in socialist feminism that the personal is political. Mm. And that doesn't mean that everything should be dissolved into the personal, but it means thinking seriously about the way that we reproduce social relationships, patriarchal relationships, capitalist relationships with each other at a kind of one-to-one level and in a group level as well as in a societal level level uh, that, that, that what what we do in the bedroom and what we do with our comrades is political and we need to think about that and work on that uh, and we've done something about the way that you know violence against women is something that runs through the left in the left organizations uh, in in our movements and we need to we need to take that seriously so there's something about connecting the personal and the political in in this process and psychoanalysis is a very good way of thinking about that a good, very good way of making that connection because we can start to think about the way that we do things unwittingly unconsciously we don't mean 
to reproduce these bad relationships with our comrades, but we do it. We keep doing it. And there's something unconscious and driven in that that we need to come to terms with if we're going to be able to change it. Yeah, I think psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic insight and our relationships are really important because I have been in many organizations and one of the hardest things in those organizations, and it still is, is to get past a resolution of how we treat each other, what we owe each other and anyone who comes into our organization in terms of the way they're treated because there's a meanness that is allowed that can't be allowed because it's the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. And that's these unconscious hierarchies and power relationships. And so the personal there is very political because also in my long experience, I must say that people leave political organizations, as far as I can see, much more because they're personally hurt and upset than because they're ideologically different. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. That's my experience as well. Yeah, sure. It's very sad. Tragic. Mm, it is tragic. And it isn't only intellectual, because as I've mentioned in Women's Liberation, I had one rule at the beginning, and everyone liked it, which is everybody is welcome to speak except people who know exactly what we should do. They have to go. Um <laughs> Because there's an acceptance that we are in this together trying to figure it out rather than we have the answer and shut up everybody who doesn't agree. And I suppose something I suppose connected with that is uh, something that I like about psychoanalysis, which is different from psychology and psychiatry, is that the psychoanalyst doesn't give the interpretations of course, mm -hmm. there are psychoanalysts who do that. Yes, of course there are. But yeah. uh, I think authentic psychoanalysis is a listening practice yes. which enables people to have a space to speak, to hear themselves speak, and to come up with interpretations themselves mm -hmm. that will be empowering and will, will change the way that they, that they change who they are. Yeah, It's, it's the... Analysand, that is the, the the person who comes into analysis, who does the analyzing, not the psychoanalyst. The psychoanalyst notices kind of turns of phrase and repetitions and you know this kind of thing and draws attention to them, but should not say this means that. Right. Or, you're talking to me because I'm like your dad or something like that. Oh. It, it, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yes, uh, it, it is. Just, it just keeps the power relation going. The, the task of psychoanalysis is to give people a space to hear what they're saying and to change themselves, to change themselves. Yeah. It's not, it's not, you can think of it in political terms as, as being like uh, the consciousness of the working class is going to come from its own struggle and its own praxis. And we in different left organizations can provide some resources to help in that process, but we we are not the vanguard. We are not the leaders. It's going to be the working class in all of its diversity that is going to learn itself about the world and change itself as it changes the world. It's like an analysand in analysis. You can't tell them how to think. No, and it's different from the kind of teaching that is helpful that says these are the dominant for example, these are the dominant um, ideas about the U.S. family. This is the reality of the U.S. family. How does it affect you? So that some of that is also because people are so are fed ideology so forcefully as well as subtly everywhere. Some of the job of the anal the ana the psychoanalyst psychoanalyst is supposed to listen, but the political operative is supposed to show also to say, oh my God, look where we're living. Look what's happening to you. And this is the story you've been fed. But there's another story that might feel more familiar. I think of it, you know, in political terms, um, I think of transitional politics in which people are drawn up against the barriers 
up against the bars of the cage mm. to make demands that are reasonable, practical demands, but demands that cannot be met by capitalism. Right. They come up and they see what is what is holding them in place, and and it, it, they can see that the system is unreasonable, irrational, uh, holding them back. And they say, "Well, no, this isn't a way to live. Right. The way to live is is on our collective activity, um, caring for each other. And this system doesn't allow us to care for each other." Yeah, it's basic, you know. If you ever teach nursery school i mean that's just not nice Cap, what they do taking more for yourself and giving less to everybody else you're supposed to share i mean <laughs> you don't civilize people with capitalist values cuz that wouldn't work and that's basic it's also a contradiction in capitalist ideology between what you teach children and what you practice and they learn yeah and i think that sort of as a as a sort of a conclusion or summary, mm. I think that that is exactly what happens. It's that the, this from school to work, the, the systems that you live in, you are frequently, maybe even silently, um, uh, converted to seeing the world a particular mm. way and it does damage, uh, or it, it, it creates at least distress and that, it's interesting that people have some sort of intuition or knowledge that there is something off. Yes. At a certain point, they reach a dead end and they can't keep going and they need the private space if they can get it to just be able to talk to someone and sort of get through all the words till they can get to a truth <laughs> that makes sense to them opposed to having to be force-fed a particular ideology i think that's sort yeah. of fascinating because yeah. as you said in, in you know in this and in the book that ultimately this is a talking cure now just as a sort of uh, a side note one of the things that i find really interesting in stuff that i've read uh and particularly around um psychoanalysis but maybe lots of sort of academic things is that i find that there's normally quite a strong emphasis on language being like the primary thing that constructs us. And generally speaking, I agree. We can make people feel like crap or we can make them feel good depending on what language we use. Um, but given that this idea of uh, the unconscious is sort of socialized, um, I wonder also how, if it, can be structured not just with language because of things like is. music, art, dance, photography, film, you know, they all have this sort of profound or can, well, good art, I would say, has a profound emotional impact on people. Yeah. And I wonder if that has some, I wonder where that fits in, in ideas around liberation or revolution. Like, I wonder if it helps to dislodge things that words have made into cement, you know? Mm. Um, I don't really, <laughs> yeah. it's not really a question, I guess. It's just, yeah, how does that stuff fit in? Beyond language, how does the, those disciplines, how do they help or, or not with liberation? Well, I use, I think I think of lang language in a very broad sense. You know? um, mm. I think of language as being all of the symbolic, structured stuff that we encounter in the world that makes us human. And that would include the structure mm. of buildings, the structure of the spaces that we have to speak in, uh, the meanings that we give to the planet that we live on. All of this is symbolic. So I think of our language, our language as including all of those things, just like you said, Liam, all of those things that you mentioned, I would think as being symbolically structured as part of the language that we use language in a very broadest sense, the language mm. that we must use in order to make sense of things together. And I suppose it's one of the paradoxes of capitalist society is that we're isolated from each other, atomized, separated from each other, but we're still social beings. 
We're still social beings all the time. We reach yes. out to others. We make sense of the world with others through the language that we use. And that that contradiction kind of is experienced by us at a very deep level in our alienation and our distress. That mm. contradiction um, and Marxism and psychoanalysis are two ways of opening up what it is to be a human being through our language and our social practice doing that working with us to to transform the world instead of simply living with it and thinking that everything must be as it is now yeah that's very powerful and i think of an illustration that really brings it across in terms of language being the environment and art i often think what would there are buses that go around new york city and I saw one that had uh, some movie star with a gun at somebody else's throat saying, make my day. And it was a big gun. Then I was thinking, that's part of what we take in. What if somebody yeah. was a, a man vacuuming and saying, got to get that last dirty spot. And we <laughs> saw that every time the bus passed. What would it contribute yeah. to us? Or holding his baby and saying, it's okay, baby. And that would be on, on the bus. Yeah, sure. It's yeah. all part of our cultural um, equipment that we take in, like language, symbolically. Yeah. yeah, and you're totally right. Like there, there are sort of ways that, say, cinematography and film certainly mm. has a language. I, I guess I took it quite <laughs> i took the language quite literally um, sure. but yeah, yeah no i i thought it was a great yeah, it's a great book and it's been um it is yeah it's been a great conversation i've really uh enjoyed it me too hope you well, did thanks. too ian yeah thanks Re really nice to to uh to, to go through these ideas in a different way with different different standpoints it's something different happens yeah sure yes it does. That's everyone you talk to. Something different happens in every relationship. You know, I've discovered that because people seem to grieve their parent only when they grieve the person they were in that parent's eyes. Because mm -hmm. every relationship changes who you are in that moment in that relationship. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's been very powerful. Thank you. Well, thank you. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. Capitalism Hits Home is a sort of broader over overhead view. It explores the way that capitalism shapes our personal lives, our psyches, our relationships, our families, and it looks particularly at the sea change in American personal life as all Americans, but the top 10 or 20 percent of Americans, have our security and our chance for a future become as precarious as it always was for minorities and families headed by women. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home are definitely complimentary. And if listeners would like to check out Capitalism Hits Home, Harriet, where should they go to find it? Either on YouTube or Democracy at Work or on my own website, harrietfraud.com.